Saidi Purji, and a very warm welcome to everyone. Honestly, uh, you know, uh, while we stayed away for some time uh, from doing some of our programs, uh, after we came back, uh, we realized this is what we're really missing. So we promise you, we will have more of this. And thank you for joining us today evening. As a citizen of India, the sovereign democratic republic that in between became a socialist and secular one as well, the fundamental document that governs our life is the constitution of the country. But other than one small chapter in the civics book when we were kids, and the fact that Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar was the chairman of its drafting committee, not much was known to most of us until, of course, the World Wide Web and its numerous trivia sources came into limelight. However, what we feel is extremely important for a document like the Constitution is understanding the history, the timeline, the lineage, and the ethos of its creation. Irrespective of however a daunting topic, any topic may look, we at Prabodhan Manch have been very fortunate to have extremely knowledgeable and articulate speakers. Today is no exception. I'm very pleased to welcome and introduce our speaker for the day, Sri J. Sai Deepak. Sai Deepak ji, welcome. Yes. And welcome back to Prabodhan Mancha in a different format. A casual look at the blue tick Twitter handle, Twitter handle that shows more than one and a half lakh followers tells you that our speaker needs no further introduction. Uh, one of India's brightest and youngest Supreme Court advocates, alum of IIT Kharagpur Law School, an ardent votary of the Indic School of Thought and the reclaimed temples from government movements, Sai Deepak Ji is today a very well-known face. Sai Deepak Ji, uh, before we turn to our topic of the day, a small update from our side since you last met us and our audience uh, way back in December 2018. Uh, in these 30 months, Prabodhan Mancha has grown. Uh, thanks to the patronage of people like yourselves. We have doubled our database to about 2,500 people. We have quadrupled our YouTube subscribers to over 10,200 now. And we have tripled our contributors to over 200, uh, of whom 50 have made multiple contributions. So in leading into today's discussion, Saidi Pakji, uh, my first question to you would be, why did you decide to write a book and more importantly, why this topic? So first of all, um, Raganji, let me congratulate Prabodhan Manch for uh, having grown leaps and bounds. Uh, till date, I have said this on multiple platforms that my session at Parley uh, with your members happens to be one of my most favorite sessions because the audience was an enlightening audience and the questions that were put uh, through you, your moderation, and the sheer uh, energy levels of that particular audience is something that I continue to carry. In fact, if you look at many of my social media platforms, this is the one talk that I've constantly shared over and over again, because there are several questions that according to me, managed to bring out the best of my abilities to answer some of the, let's say, important questions and burning questions of the day that face the civilization. So I'm very, very happy that Munch has uh, managed to increase its stakeholdership, if I may call it so. And I wish your team members and the platform its very, very best. Uh, coming to the question that you've specifically put, in fact, uh, if, I may, if I may actually put this in this manner, a significant number of questions that were put to me the last time in December 2018, when I first uh, uh, spoke to your members and when I was given a platform, uh, I have tried to address all those questions in a very systematic and coherent fashion as part of a larger narrative. Because typically we understand the constitution as the product of a national movement, as the product of a national deliberation. But if you look at history, especially global history, the formation of India's constitutional thought process in the 20th century is not the solitary product of a national movement. In fact, it is the product of a global movement towards some form of modern constitutionalism. And what were its driving forces? What were its motivating factors? Has this got something to do with the factum of global colonization by Europe? 
and whether there are significant aspects of Europeanism that have influenced modern constitutionalism. If that be the case, what is the meaning of secularism as understood from a European perspective? What is the origin of this particular word? What is the meaning of humanism? Because these days, everybody is now suddenly developing this fashion of saying, I don't subscribe to any particular religion. I'm a humanist. What is the meaning of humanism is something that most people don't understand. So these are aspects that I have tried to actually compile and collate in a very systematic fashion, wherein I discuss the global origins of these concepts and the application of these global origins or let's say of these global concepts to India as a specific region, as a specific civilization and a specific, uh, let's say, territory and society. And more than India, Bharat, because the idea of Bharat has been somehow submerged uh, under the layers of India, so to speak, over the decades. So these are the different aspects that I try to actually uh, uh, unravel as I write, uh, as I uh, let's say go along this particular trilogy. So this particular book represents the first part of my trilogy called the Bharat Trilogy. So the idea is to basically capture all the thoughts that I have put out of the last five years, but give them a very specific conceptual framework, as opposed to making it just a collection or compilation of the thoughts that I've put out. So that there is some consistency that underpins everything that I have said. There is some common aspect that I try to highlight and underscore in each talk, which is the presence of a certain form of consciousness that has influenced our thinking over the decades. So which is what I call as colonial consciousness or colonial or coloniality. Therefore, the topic or let's say the subtitle of the book more or less reflects the theme that it tries to convey. The subtitle happens to be coloniality, civilization and constitution, wherein I try to explain that civilization, the Bharatiya civilization is effectively sandwiched between colonial consciousness on the one hand and the constitution on the other. And what kind of tensions inform this particular let's say, triple matrix is something that I try to uncover in the book. So that in a nutshell is the sum and substance of the book. And those are the reasons for writing this book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, you know, uh, First question, uh, you started, uh, you know, of course, we are all awaiting the book, uh, but in reading some of the background material, uh, you said that it covers the period from 1491. Uh, what is the significance of choosing that date? Um, and a related question, if you could answer, right. because a lot of us in India uh, do believe that uh, Chanakya was one of the first architects of writing some sort of treaties on how governance should be. Uh, so why did you not right. cover some of the period uh, from Chanakya to say that time? Right. So this particular book, its timeline is from 1492 to 1919. And there's a specific uh, reason for it. So typically when we speak of European colonialism, we associate the 17th century and the 18th century in global history as the period of colonialism. Whereas if you look at the actual scholarship, it dates this entire incident or this entire phase of global history back to 1492, because that was the year Columbus started his expedition. And that is the year he started looking for India. Therefore, Columbus's expedition in search of Bharat or India is effectively the global milestone, which marks the beginning of colonialism as an entire phase. Okay. Most people assume that uh, let's say it starts with the colonization of America and other places, but they were looking for Bharat. They were looking for India. Okay. So when somebody asks us or somebody tries to tell us that India had no origins or there was no concept of India before 1947, they have to simply look at this history, which clearly says that all these Spanish explorers and Portuguese explorers and European colonists were looking for India because this was the land of gold and spices and riches and whatnot. Okay. So the idea is to basically say, what is it that triggered this particular uh, voyage of Columbus, Christopher Columbus? Did it have a religious motive? Did it have a racial motive? Okay. Was the racial motive inspired by the religious motive? In case, in, in, in which case, what is the religion? And if the religion is Christianity, then what is the belief in Christianity that advances the concept of colonization, that motivates this concept of colonization? These are aspects that I effectively try to uncover. Because you see, whether we like it or not, the fact of the matter is that the contemporary world that we live in is the product of European colonization 
and every other let's say development which followed it or every other milestone that followed it right from the clothes that we wear to the language that we subscribe to or the language that we unfortunately think in to the language that has become the medium of communication to the mode of transaction to the economic models to the constitutional models and legal models almost everything is the product of this of the last 500 years of global history okay therefore i am trying to look at the modern constitutional behavior and constitutional thought process within the global panorama of european colonization i'm saying you can't try and understand india's constitutionalism independent of european colonization that is the central purpose of this particular book therefore if we have to understand why is it that bharatiya sanskriti and bharatiya samvidhan are at times loggerheads with each other okay why is constitutional morality at loggerheads with public morality and civilizational morality that particular question cannot be understood or answered or tackled without understanding the european origins of contemporary constitutionalism okay hence i am trying to cover these aspects now coming to the second part of your question as to why is it that i have not covered arthashastra or let's say indic thought processes with respect to constitutionalism that will come in the second part of the trilogy okay <laughs> because you see i end this particular book in 1919 which is when the first british made constitution for bharat came into existence which is the government of india act of 1919 okay this was followed by the government of india act of 1935 the basic structure of government of india act of 1919 and 1935 they formed the dhancha or the mold for the 1947 constitution okay or the 1950 constitution so to speak therefore i am trying to go back further into time and then connect all three dots and when i discuss the let's say the actual framing of the current constitution then i will ask the question as to whether the framers of the constitution considered our thought processes our jurisprudence our traditions our political economic structures our own traditions of republican structures and panchayati models and democratic forms and confederacy forms when they were framing this particular constitution or were they completely influenced by the let's say the european wave so to speak therefore that question will be addressed in the second book okay the third book will cover the pd from 1951 to 1977 significantly because as you mentioned in the opening the words secular and socialist were introduced as part of the indira gandhi regime so at least until 1977 the third book will cover therefore the idea is significantly to understand the period which led to the framing of the constitution going back to at least 5 centuries before okay and the first 30 to 40 years of independent modern republic okay so that we understand the difference between the constitution as it existed in 1950 and the changes that it underwent until 1977 as a consequence of let's say political motivations okay so these are the aspects that i hope to uncover and there will be a significant discussion on whether we succeeded or failed in incorporating native thought processes as part of our constitution framing that will happen in the second book uh and and i think you've already answered my question i was about to ask you why a trilogy but i think you've already right. covered that uh, right. so thanks for that uh let's let's again uh want to understand you know you did mention that you know prior to the book uh, you have been speaking at various places that's what sort of gave you some idea of what to cover but as a audience uh who is this book for uh, and you know uh, is this book for somebody who wants to understand the constitution or is it book for even the lay person is it really for the law fraternity just give us some idea of where you will uh, see see you know this going anybody who is frustrated with the constant citing of the constitution whenever we discuss the civilization should be reading the book okay anybody who believes that the entire concept of public morality has been replaced by this mythical creature called constitutional morality should be reading this book anyone who asks why is it that every native practice institution tradition and structure constantly finds itself in the court of law trying to prove itself should be reading this book okay anybody who asks why is it that the indian constitution is so long and it's so let's say uh, uh, verbose compared to the american constitution which is about just 15 pages long should be reading this particular book anybody who is interested in understanding the confluence of history civilization political science and the constitution should be reading this book and there's a reason for this 
the constitution as a document is not a strictly legal document it certainly has a legal character because it is meant to enforce a certain concept and a certain rule of law but it is the product of history and it is the product of multiple pulls and tugs okay therefore what are its social underpinnings what are its theological underpinnings if at all there are any okay are there any religious biases which are there in this particular book okay is the book socialist in character that we constantly keep citing okay if so what is the meaning of the socialism okay and when we when we keep using the word india as a secular state india as a secular state today it has come to a point we are telling the entire country that india is a secular society no we are not a secular society the state is different from the society okay the society is a seriously religious society in different ways whereas the state has chosen to be above religion and that too in a very selective fashion after the 1970s okay therefore when somebody says we are a secular society it shows the utter confusion in the minds of the people because they are unable to separate polity from society they are unable to separate the state from the rest of the society so these are the various questions so for instance one of the things that i cite in the opening chapters of the book is that uh, my arguments in the sabrimala case uh, while it received a significant amount of coverage was also the subject of severe criticism for being traditional for being orthodox for being patriarchal and so on and so forth what is the origin of the word traditional why has it received this kind of negative connotation what is the meaning of the word modern whether it has any colonial assumption okay these are aspects that i try and unpack in this particular book okay so everything that we take for granted in our regular conversations about politics and constitution i am trying to cover uncover each of those layers so that people understand oh so when i say modern i don't realize the serious biases it carries with it okay why why don't i use the word contemporary as opposed to modern okay so when you say modern typically the imagery that it evokes in your mind is a westernized model of the society okay so the equation of modern with the western okay and the equation of the secular state with the western form of state okay these are different aspects which need to be busted because people i'm sorry to say don't know much about this and whatever they have learnt about this is through secondary propositions or most of this is hidden in hardcore academic literature nobody wants to read it okay so think of my book as a midway which tries to simplify that academic literature and tries to present it in a very lucid readable form for anyone who is above the age of 15 because i don't believe that the age of adulthood is 18 anymore okay i believe that people i mean uh, youngsters at the age of 15 are perhaps uh, as intelligent as we were at the age of 18 okay at the very least given the crimes given the exposure given the internet and what not i certainly believe that anyone upwards 15 should be able to read this book uh, there may be a bit of let's say academic jargon that is used in it but what i have done is that i have tried to break it down to the best of my abilities so that anybody can pick up the book and make sense of all the constitutional noise that is be- being made around us that's the substance of the book so i hope that age will not prove to be a barrier and i would certainly consider it a failure if only lawyers read this book lawyers according to me are barely 25 to 30% of the target audience okay the entire humanity side in the age group of 18 to 70 anybody who is interested in understanding the psyche of the modern society of the modern indian society i would say should read this book thanks Uh, so now that we've sort of got a, uh, an idea of you know why you wrote uh, writing this book and and what uh, you tried to cover some questions which we had in our mind you may have unraveled but some more which may come through uh, and starting with you know the whole aspect of the colonial mindset right uh, now the the foundation of that uh, is it uh, you mentioned the 1919 act but uh, is it also true that you know the the act passed in 1858 which was the government of india act 1858 passed after as a response to the first war of independence was that the starting or or it was there something else in terms of the legalities uh, that started this whole process so it's a fantastic question and i'm happy that you've actually asked this question even without reading the book because it's it's an extremely important phase in bharat's history okay so uh, just to give you a sneak peek 
I the last four chapters of the book effectively cover this entire period from 1853 onwards, and 1858 onwards is specifically covered in the 10th and the 11th chapter, where I deal with the Government of India Act of 1858. Okay, very very specifically, and uh, I must actually appreciate your question for its incisiveness because it represents something fundamental in terms of the shift. Because you see. Until then, Bharat was governed by the company. Okay. And the British crown took over in 1858 after the Indian Revolution of 1857. Because they believed that the company had made a pig's breakfast of its administration in Bharat. Okay. And they believed that uh, such a vast country should not be run by a small bunch of commercial men. That was the thought process in the British parliament. Okay. But usually when we speak of this administration from 1858 under the Government of India Act of 1858, you see the, uh, the common uh, perception is that when they set up this administrative structure in Bharat, it was a purely secular administrative structure, that it had no religious connotations to it, that it had no religious basis or foundations to it. The very language of the 1858 Act, the discussions in the British Parliament of 1858 prior to the legislation being brought into force and the subsequent discussions before the 1919 Act clearly show that there was not a single iota of deviation from the Christian nature of the establishment that was put together in Bharat by the Englishmen. Okay, so typically when you talk to academics or some scholars, they have a view that because of the reasons for the 1857 rebellion, which is typically attributed to the greased cartridges in the Enfield rifles, from what I understand, okay, saying that Muslims had a problem with it because pork was used to grease the cartridges and Hindus had a problem with it because it had beef or let's say cow fat in it. What they don't realize is it was not religion that was the reason for it, but because the army was significantly comprised based on caste identities. Okay, so you had Brahmins and Rajputs or Kshatriyas coming from Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, Avadh and all these or United Provinces in these regions. Okay, and therefore they were very, very wary of violating the caste rules when it comes to dietary restrictions. Okay, so religion from let's say a macro perspective, but primarily they were afraid of being outcast by their castes. Okay, so that is what actually led to the rebellion. But most importantly, what most people assume is since religion is seen as a trigger for the rebellion, the British establishment suddenly uh, acquired for itself a secular character and distance itself from any kind of religious activity is the assumption. But what happened was the exact opposite. Okay, while they kept calling themselves a tolerant establishment, while they kept calling themselves a secular establishment, the kind of statutory support, legal support that was given to missionaries to continue doing their work is recorded in their parliamentary debates, is recorded specifically in their statutory process of 1858, is specifically recorded in the Act of 1919. Imagine 1857 is the rebellion, 1858 is the next act which comes about. 1919 to 1858, you're looking at at least half a century apart. Okay. But the thought process has not changed. Okay. So the Government of India Act of 1919 was the product of a very specific report on constitutional reforms called the Montford Report. Okay. If you read that report, they specifically explain that their idea is to bring the concept of Christian civilization to Bharat. Okay. I have extracted the portions of the report. And then I have shown how the intention of the report was specifically captured in express provisions of the 1919 Act. So I'm so grateful for this question because these are the very aspects that I actually capture. So most people would have discussed merely, let's say the Act said this, the Act said that. I have extracted the language of the Act. I have also extracted the British parliamentary debates so that nobody can say that my confirmation bias is informing these conclusions. Okay. Because typically the idea is to put all of this in the appendix of the book. But who reads the appendix of the book? Okay. So I said I might as well put this in the heart of the book itself so that people can read it for themselves and then ask whether I am inviting them to come to a certain conclusion or whether the facts speak for themselves. Okay. Uh, you alluded to this, uh, but uh, you know, 
uh, I will still ask uh, that amongst the democracies of the world, I believe ours is one of the lengthiest constitutions, 395 articles, eight schedules, right. so on and so forth. Right. Could it have been brief, concise, simple? I know hypothetical, but could it have been? So you see, quite a few things are typically based on hindsight. Okay. Maybe in 2021, after having enjoyed the benefit of a union of over 560 princely states, today maybe we have the luxury of undertaking this particular discussion. But when a union is effectively the product of more than 500 princely states, with each of whom you have entered into multiple negotiations, with each of whom you have entered into multiple covenants, okay, uh, I don't think it would have been possible to have a shorter constitution simply because the constitution reflects the, the let's say if the, if the country is a lady which is pregnant, okay, then the constitution is the product of the labor pain. Okay, so I don't think everybody's pain threshold is the same. The circumstances in which America was formed and the circumstances in which Bharat was formed, or let's say not Bharat, the contemporary Republic of Bharat was formed, are not exactly identical. They're nowhere close to each other. Okay. Coupled with the fact that you had such religious tensions, which led to the partition of this great civilization on religious lines, I don't think the constitution could have been simpler or let's say briefer, so to speak. However, my central question wouldn't be about the longevity of the constitution or the length of the constitution, but it would perhaps be about the indigenous character of the constitution. Okay. So my question would be, does it reflect Bharatiya ethos? Okay. Does it reflect our spirit? Lamba hai ya chota hai, mujhe se koi farak nahi padta hai. Okay. Ye apna hai ya bahar ka hai? That's the first question. Okay. As long as it happens to be a constitution that is inspired by Indic ethos and indigenous ideas, I don't have a problem with its longevity or I don't have a problem with its length or breadth or whatever it may be. Okay. All of that is secondary. The first question is, is a foreign idea being imposed to us through the instrumentality of the constitution? If the answer is a yes, did you take my consent before doing that? If you have not done that, how do you call this constitution the product of a democratic consensus? That's the simple question that should be asked. So I think, you know, you've almost uh, given me the lead for my next question. And that is uh, very simply that uh, in, a, in, a, in creating this constitution, should we not have been more explicit about ideas like nation building, fundamental philosophical or ideological principles, something about the majoritarian view. I mean, should those things have not been brought out very clearly? So it so happens that the poor dissemination of, let's say, the, the constant assembly debates or very little discussion around what multiple people said, okay, is perhaps the reason that even if such sentiments had been expressed during the framing of the constitution, we are unaware, unaware of it. Because you see, frankly speaking, today's discussion around the constitution ends uh, with a, let's say, a discussion around two figures. Either it's Nehru or Ambedkar, that's it. Okay, we don't go beyond that. Surely two people couldn't have put together this constitution. In fact, Nehru's contribution to this constitution is minimal. Okay, and Dr. Ambedkar, with all due respect to his legal standing, his erudition and whatnot, did not craft this constitution. He was not the author of this constitution because the Constituent Assembly appointed an advisor to the Constituent Assembly by the name of Sri Benegal Narsing Rao, B. N. Rao. Okay. He was the author of the constitution. He put together a basic draft and that draft was shared with what is known as the drafting committee. Okay. The drafting committee's job was to refine the basic draft given to them by Dr. Rao. Okay. The chairman of this drafting committee was Dr. Ambedkar. Okay. So the drafting committee had eight or seven or eight members. They elected Dr. Ambedkar as the chairman of this particular drafting committee who chose to ultimately refine this particular constitution. Therefore, strictly speaking, Dr. Ambedkar is not the author of this constitution. He is the refiner of the basic draft presented by Dr. B. N. Rao. See, these are the kind of myths that need to be busted. Okay. Very little is known about the actual role of Dr. Ambedkar. I'm not saying his role is negligible. I'm merely saying that we don't need to 
deify him for reasons that he is not responsible for okay there are other reasons to actually uh, respect him there are other worthy reasons to actually uh, respect him for his contributions to the constitution okay he certainly discussed and debated this constitution after having placed this in the assembly and there were significant let's say inputs from shri lokanath mishra who is the uh, father of the current mp pinaki mishra okay who wanted the introduction of sanskrit as the national language okay then you had uh, significant contributions from kulapati k m munshi and shri k m munshi as we all know is the founder of the bharati vidya bhavan okay so could these people have not expressed sentiments which are indigenous of course they would have right you had rajagopal achari you had k v kamath these are all people who were sanskrit scholars and when the word bharat was inserted in article 1 we had people citing the puranas the itihasas and the vedas okay so how is it that this particular constitution is now being presented as a secular document that has got nothing to do with dharma or nothing to do with the civilization so therefore the document has undergone multiple corruptions in the public discourse okay so these are aspects that i will certainly capture in the sequel to the book but what i have done is that why india has also been called bharat i have extracted and discussed the entire constant assembly debate on this particular issue as to how they cite the skanda puran the vayu puran and what not to say why is bharat bharat why are we tracing our origins back to the period before the islamic invasions or european colonization therefore we are clearly associating ourselves with an identity which existed prior to these two waves of colonization okay so i've captured all of that okay so the fundamental idea is all these popular myths that whatsapp university constantly feeds our people i'm trying to say sorry there is much more to the constitution there is it is certainly not the ideal uh, let's say document but it is certainly a mixed bag which has enough for us to draw heart from okay i'll try and address that when i write the yeah. sequel yeah. uh just changing a little tack uh, i mean you know this the case of anand bharati case uh, landmark legal case supreme right. court said while parliament can amend each and every article in the constitution of india it cannot alter its basic structure i think that was the essence right right in your view have subsequent parliaments really followed this when making all the amendments so by and large let's say those features or those aspects which have been distilled as the basic features of the constitution i would say have been protected simply because nobody now wants the tag of being a draconian regime like indira gandhi's regime of 1975 to 1977 okay there is a significant degree of fear of being chided by the public and criticized by the public okay i am not saying that constitutionalism has not been diluted or i am not saying that the constitutional uh, constitution sanctity has been preserved but by and large those basic features have been preserved but the other question that i would certainly want to ask is when they decided to identify what the basic features of the constitution are did they again apply a foreign principle okay what is the manner in which these basic features were identified and distilled and in identifying these basic features have they taken away the right of the future generations to depart and deviate from what they believe as the basic feature of the constitution okay if tomorrow i believe that the times warrant a significant departure from the basic features of the constitution which have been identified by the supreme court do i have the freedom to do so is it possible for the judiciary to shackle the future generations from taking a decision with respect to the constitution these are the larger questions that i believe that we must try and understand because you see when they tried to apply this doctrine of basic feature they actually were applying a principle that was evolved from german constitutions okay where there is a specific provision for it or there is a specific discussion with respect to it okay so here again what is so bharati about the basic feature doctrine is the question that i'd like to ask okay and secondly the constitution is the means to an end to protect the constitution is uh, alone according to me is is akin to protecting let's say the operation as opposed to the patient who is the subject of the surgery okay so you must try and ask yourself does it protect the identity that we have been fighting for for over a millennia after constant waves of invasions and colonization 
if that particular big picture is completely lost you can call it the basic feature doctrine you can give it any esoteric name you want but you would have failed in the big picture and you would have lost the forest for the trees uh in in going with uh, because i think uh, you made a reference to the uh, 1977 january 3rd amendment uh, and i know this could get a little controversial sometimes but you know the word socialist secular appearing between sovereign and democratic republic right your views on that amendment so about 25% or maybe at i'll say at least about 15 to 20% of the book deals with the european origins of secularism okay and it starts from let's say the uh, early 10th 11th century goes on until the peace of westphalia of 1648 october 1648 and then the rise of european nationalism and the consequent rise of secularism and on this i have placed significant reliance on established scholars like jacob de ruwer okay wherein i have tried to explain that secularism as understood in europe is christian secularism and secularism as understood in bharat means militant irreligious secularism and we constantly keep citing european traditions but we follow a different tradition in bharat altogether secularism when understood in europe means the state shall not interfere with religion because religion is the exclusive preserve of the church okay and that does not take away the right of the state to have a very specific christian identity that is the important point which means every christian every european state has a christian identity either roman catholic identity or the protestant identity but it is not secular in the manner we understand it which is to say it has no religion okay so you see how secularism originated in the land of its origin how it is applied in the mothership which is europe and by the time it comes to bharat and by the time our geniuses start making sense of it we completely remove its religious character okay so therefore my attempt in this book through primary sources as well as through scholarly literature is to establish that secularism as understood in bharat is a complete corruption and aberration from the fundamental concept okay and i also make the point that the reason that it was not included in the first document of 1950 was precisely because they felt that this word could have multiple interpretations and could create serious appeasement related problems okay and their predictions have proven to be prophetic and we have seen that especially after 1976 and you know for a fact that no government i repeat no government has been an exception to this appeasement policy everybody now wants to show how secular they are by proving the quantity or the quantum of minority scholarships and the amount that they've actually come out with okay so it is really surprising that they are asking us to put faith in their secular character by looking at their investment in minority scholarships <laughs> so you are asking me to look at your contribution to a specific religious community to prove your secular credentials how stupid and how moronic this concept is okay so which is why we have tried i have tried through the book to ex expose this entire stupidity to say what you think you know of secularism is not are not its origins and the manner in which you have applied it is fundamentally antithetical to the spirit of this land and it has worked to the detriment of indigenous ethos and values uh so you know uh, with that and with some of the uh, aspects that you mentioned uh have we you know created some unnecessary holy cows and you know you know as as for example and, and we can we can uh debate this uh reservation uh created at a point of time for some reason is it now a holy cow which cannot get debated and there are many more and we'll ask you about that as well so the only holy cow that i think should be venerated is the holy cow itself okay and everything else especially in a legal document and a constitutional document should not be elevated to the status of a religious document okay it's a man made document it is the product of political expediency and exigencies and historical necessities and that's where its veneration must end it serves a very practical political and let's say societal purpose 
beyond that to treat this as some holy document that all of us are supposed to prostrate at the feet of i'm sorry to say make some mockery of the origins of constitutionalism itself so in fact there is one particular chapter of the book where i call constitutionalism as the new religion of let's say uh, decolonized societies okay where now they have previously the white colonizer wanted us to venerate the bible now that he has left he wants us to venerate the constitution as the new bible okay and i've said this as much because that was the intent to use the constitution to civilize natives in the christian mold that is the stated intent in, in fact they said this in the league of nations they said this in the league of nations which is the precursor to the united nations by the way the very origins of league of nations and its founding in christian principles i have captured this in chapter 10 and chapter 11 specifically saying how international movements specifically the role of the protestant movement coupled with the fact that the paris peace conference which resulted in the end of the first world war constantly spoke of bringing about christian peace in the world imagine the concept of peace being given a religious connotation such as christian peace christian peace christian morality christian brotherhood you will see this repeatedly mentioned in every debate and every speech in the league of nations and in the british parliament okay therefore what i have tried to say is that please remove these layers of colonial mindset and colonial consciousness understand secularism for what it is understand constitutionalism for what it is and please try and move closer to your roots because countries in africa have done a much better job of africanizing their legal thought processes than bharat has people in bharat have a typical let's say mindset of looking down at let's say africa or people coming from africa but if you look at how they have managed to brilliantly capture let's say the indigenous nature of their legal processes after decolonization they have done a vastly superior job compared to bharat okay kenya has done a better job by the way i don't even have to talk of south africa kenya has done a better job than bharat okay so in bharat whenever we speak of the constitution we try and move closer to europe that seems to be the sad reality of our current situation and that we don't need to do so is what i have tried to say in this uh coming to one more holy cow and uh, i think there is some uh, suspense in the air given august 5th is approaching right uh, when we talk about equality is the uniform civil code envisaged supported in the constitution of india see the uniform civil code is specifically encouraged in article 44 of the constitution there is no running away from it okay but when you speak of the uniform civil code my typical approach has been it cannot come at the expense of dharmic sampradayik institutions or our personal laws because there has to be some difference between uh, the treatment of indigenous traditions by the christian white colonizer and the indian government so to speak okay i don't want to suffer the very same consequences at the hands of a native government which i would have at the hands of a christian white government okay that's point number 1 point number 2 the uniform civil code as a concept i think i can understand but you see ultimately the devil lies in the detail okay unfortunately neither you nor i have a draft to debate and discuss if i were to ask you sir what is this uniform civil code how does it look smell taste and touch are you in a position to tell me this is how it looks you don't okay so i can't throw my weight behind it okay and given the fact that the indian state has typically adopted policies which are detrimental to the native spirit i will always approach any position that comes from the indian government that has the tendency to interfere with my personal laws with let's say a view of suspicion i will start with suspicion i have no other reason to actually give them the benefit of the doubt whether it was the previous dispensation or the current dispensation governments will come and go but societies will have to protect their core interests therefore unless and until i see the document in principle my position is agnostic i don't know i will have to see the document before i take a position see if somebody were to tell me kya aap contract pe sign karenge i'll say bhaiya contract to bata do dikha do mujhe as a lawyer i would say until i see the the blessed document in black and white why will i actually sign on a blank paper so to ask me 
to get on board the concept of uniform civil code which a lot of people on twitter have been asking me to do is to ask me to sign away my future on a blank sheet of paper which i'm not willing to do it doesn't matter to me which government is in power no government can expect me to blindly get on board with a particular concept without telling me how it actually affects me uh chaining tack and i think this question comes typically when you have a, a fairly powerful or fairly popular leader people suddenly start the debate around uh, you know is a presidential system possible in india should we have taken it up or not uh is there anything about that uh, in the constitutional assembly discussions is that something which you have thrown some light on so you see uh the idea was to certainly not run this in a presidential format okay because the question is there is a certain degree of devolution of powers between the state and the center okay the federal concept that we subscribe to uh independent of the constitution we are a federal civilization simply because the regional identity is as important as the civilizational identity and the civilizational identity is kept alive by multiple regional identities okay therefore the presidential form of government as a discussion point i am sorry to say significantly influenced for multiple reasons i'll tell you what i think those reasons are we believe today that a government is best positioned to take a decision in national interest if the number of detractors can be reduced okay and simply because of the destructive nature of the opposition and and its policies we are forced to look at these options the absence of a constructive opposition is the reason that you are forced to look at a presidential form of government okay assume for a moment that you had a better quality of opposition my simple question is would you have asked this question no you wouldn't have would this option have even shown up on the horizon if you had a better quality of opposition no so let us try and understand what is the spirit behind your question you want to ensure that there is more power at the hands of the person at the top so that he is not fettered from taking a decision in the interest of the country because of the destructive role played by the opposition so the problem that you are trying to meet is the opposition nothing else right so which means the society has to find a better response mechanism to ensure that it produces a better quality of opposition because you have to understand that the nature of politics is that what happens if the opposition were to be in power and they have a presidential form of power then then equally you are completely emasculated from any kind of let's say constructive criticism you are outside the pale of any discussion the more arrogation of power happens in one hand it is problematic because it is always transient the nature of power is transient okay the very concept of checks and balances is gone okay and i am not willing to compare our systems and our society to what happens in america because you see despite having a presidential form of government you know for a fact that the senate and let's say the republicans have significantly impeded even obama's let's say overture so to speak so ultimately in any form of government the crook will find a way because the thief is always smarter okay so i don't think there is a single law that has ever been invented which a thief cannot break okay so i would rather put faith in one basic aspect the european way of thinking is law 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 legislation parliament rule of law the indic way of thinking is invest in the society improve the quality of people so that you don't have to constantly put faith in the law to have a stick in your hand to teach people okay that means you invest in education you invest in societal autonomous institutions your religious institutions your dharmic institutions which effectively ensure that the role of man making and character making is left to your dharma gurus when you do that you are off you are obviously going to reduce the load of the state okay because you are creating a better quality of people unfortunately whenever we discuss this aspect of creating a better quality of people people start saying oh this is we are entering the realm of morality obviously you are entering the realm of morality because your problem today is the lack of morals and ethics in public life that is your central problem which is what you are trying to address through multiple surgeries and it's effectively trying to address a cancer through stitches and bandages 
Uh, coming to the the point that you mentioned about uh, you know uh, this last point, uh, did the constitution in some ways end up extending the policing nature of pre-independent institutions rather than inculcating the sense of what the government owes to its citizens? So there is a significant degree of discussion surrounding local self-governance. Okay, there is a significant. a uh, degree of discussion with respect to devolution of powers okay but you have to understand that the constitution said something but from 1952 after the first indian elections and almost until the janata party and then subsequently also when you have the same party in power notwithstanding what the constitution has said you have created a my bap mentality okay because you have flirted with marxism and you have flirted with a centralized form of running this particular country because you have decided to throw your weight behind the communist system significantly okay we may have been non aligned on paper but the fact is we were closer to the eastern bloc than the western bloc okay under the nehruvian dispensation so constitution ne to kuch kaha tha but in conduct what you have done is that you have imbibed policies and principles from the communist bloc okay therefore you have as a consequence increase the reliance of the average citizen on the state for everything you're looking at the state there is no concept of societal reliance there is no concept of self reliance you constantly say i expect this from the government i expect that from the government in which country can the government do a job as well as the private sector when it comes to significant amount of social services impossible and certainly not in a country of the diversity scale and size of bharat impossible look at the population we will overtake china in a couple of years as far as the population is concerned which government is capable of providing that kind of infrastructure when it comes to societal services so therefore the constitution supports a significant amount of devolution and autonomy but the the mindset of let's say the primary dispensation which ruled this country for its initial 45 to 50 years has created a maybap mentality so i would believe that in that particular department the current government has done a significant amount of work but it can do better i would say it can do better but it is difficult to hope let's say a revolution in 7 years after close to 60 years or 65 years of being in the gutter if i may use that language okay so i think it's going to take some time uh one last question before i move to some of my closing questions uh, and that's uh, there's a lot of debate happening on the sedition law right uh, and given that the first amendment itself uh, was triggered by uh, nehru's uh, sort of debate on on imposing this law what is the real issue around the sedition law sir so here let me play the role of a lawyer and i'll give the answer in bullet points okay one section 124a was introduced not because the british man wanted to go after our freedom fighters it was introduced because between 1860 and 1870 the tablighi movement was posing a significant challenge to british power okay therefore there was a significant islamist movement that they wanted to put down which is recorded in the in the in the let's say in the history of the uh, promulgation of this law this was introduced in bharat for the very first time in 1870 between 1860 and 1870 gandhi did not exist i'm sorry to say he was born in 1869 okay so every time someone says this was because of gandhi because this was gandhi are bhai gandhi tab the hi nahi okay 1860 to 1870 if you remember after the uh, the indian rebellion of 1857 there was a wide widespread islamist movement supported by the deobandis and everybody else which the british man wanted to counter so therefore sedition law was brought in to actually put down the islamist movement that is the reality which nobody wants to talk about okay the fact that it was subsequently used against bal gangadhar tilak is a factum of the existence of the law law ek bar ban gaya then it is applied across the board but the origins of the law was to put down the tablighi tablighi movement period okay that's the first thing second k munshi discusses sedition extensively during the course of the constant assembly debates so when someone keeps telling us ye colonial hai colonial hai are bhaiya the framers of the constitution knew this and they retained it okay for a very good reason why because from 1870 till 1947 
thanks to multiple judgments by privy council in the uk as well as indian supreme court the then supreme court the federal federal court of this country and several judges of this court the interpretation of sedition had been narrowed down significantly to basically say criticism of the government is not sedition only when you ask for dismantling of the state apparatus it will amount to sedition all of this was discussed okay and therefore they said we will retain this particular provision but bearing in mind that it can be used only when there is a threat posed to the state not to the government okay and this is the reason when this particular provision was challenged in 1962 after the constitution came into existence a five judge bench of the supreme court a constitution bench in kedar i think kedar singh versus you know versus union of india in 1962 specifically said after all of these discussions which happened in the constant assembly we see no reason to think that this is still a colonial provision because it has been considered by the framers of the constitution and therefore it has undergone the process of indianization okay so if you want to say colonial hai to bahar jana chahiye to aapka sara penal code to bahar ka hai okay what you are looking today the contract act is a colonial legislation the trust act is a colonial legislation of 1882 1872 then your your criminal penal the indian penal code is of 1860 who drafted the indian penal code macaulay who is macaulay the one who introduced english education system in this country whatsapp university keeps talking about macaulay but macaulay is the one who actually introduced the criminal system so do away with the criminal system altogether so therefore conveniently we seem to be saying ye colonial hai wo colonial hai the fact of the matter is the framers of the constitution discussed sedition and they retained it but let me address the larger issue the provision has been abused across the board by political parties okay therefore it is possible to make the provision more specific but if someone says remove the concept of sedition altogether from the statute books i am sorry to say it's an extremely mischievous suggestion where they wish to throw the baby out with the bath water that is not permissible so my last question to you because i think uh, you know we want to stick to our timelines as we right. promised you uh, there have been 103 amendments to the constitution since it was laid down right some may have been necessary some may have been imperative in your view is this constitution already completely overhauled or the fact that it needed 103 amendments means it needs a complete overhaul now no sir uh at least i would say 30 to 40% i'm being very conservative on that front of these amendments are the products of let's say necessities after the constitution has come into existence okay so if you go to europe they have several directives that come out on a regular basis with respect to the european community okay they keep changing it on a regular basis it has to meet a, a let's say an exigency so the number of amendments is not proof of the redundant nature of the document it only shows that there are certain exigencies that the document has to meet the question that i would simply ask myself is on the basic aspects of the constitution is there any way that we can bring it closer to our native spirit okay as long as that question is not addressed everything else according to me is a cosmetic inquiry okay because you see tomorrow we may want let's say a change in our language policy or we may want a change in our reservation policy or we may want a different distribution of powers between the state and the center how is this possible without a constitutional amendment you have to undertake a constitutional amendment okay so i don't have a problem with the concept of a constitutional amendment at all okay but i will simply ask the basic question did we take enough efforts after the let's say after 1950 when we realized the kind of mischief that this particular document was being used for to make it less mischief proof or let's say make it less less mischief prone okay on that particular front i don't think any government has has done a good job no government and no dispensation because everybody seems to have an incentive to keep this particular document alive for, to further their own agenda so to speak nobody is interested in addressing the core issue that remains a fact uh saidip ji as we bring this webinar to a close a formal vote of thanks first and foremost our speaker of the day saidip ji as i mentioned earlier notwithstanding the complex nature of today's topic the lucidity of your thoughts and the eloquence of your speech has made it easy for our audience i think to understand their own constitution better thanks for taking the time to be with us uh, i know you've been very hectic uh, preparations and and you also been sort of preparing for the book launch 
So all the very best to you for your book launch. And we will shortly circulate the link for the purchase of this book as well to all our viewers. We, of course, look forward to hosting you in person as soon as larger gatherings can resume. Uh, thanks again uh, to Shrita Endulkar for his quick turnaround on the posters, uh, Parak Khot for his technical know-how. Our sincere and biggest thanks, as always, are to our dear audience. Uh, your encouragement and feedback keeps us going, and please, please continue that. We are truly overwhelmed by your support, and we pray that the same will continue as always. As mentioned in the concluding part of this trilogy, which is on Sunday, August 8th at 11 a.m., Another of our previous speakers, Vikram Sampad, I think Saidipaji, you know him as well. Uh, Vikram just released the part two of his book on the life of Veer Savarkar. Uh, so we will be circulating the link of that program in the next few days. 